watch your username and password, people. And if you do make it from somebody else, make sure that you log out first so you don't have that situation. T, are you leaving me? Everybody say bye, T. Thank you everybody for coming out for Genealogy Day this year. My name is Deborah Dudak. I'm from the Fountaindale Public Library in Bolingbrook. This is the third session of our Genealogy Day 2019 lineup. Our guest speaker this afternoon is Marsha Peterson Moss and she's going to be giving a presentation on using today's commercial DNA test results in a medical family tree. It's very complicated, very, very complicated subject. However, Marsha is an amazing teacher and she will give you all the information that you need. So please give Marsha a warm round of applause. Thank you. everybody. Wonderful to be here. I recognize so many of you from the many years that I have been teaching this topic, so glad to have you back. Uh, I wanted to say a few things before we get into our topic. Um, I think that this is one of the toughest topics that I teach. As I was talking to a lot of you before we got into the, uh, this before I took the stage, many of you were honest with me and you said, I really don't like thinking about my medical conditions. And you know what? Thank you for being honest because I would say at least the people who I talk to, three quarters of us don't even want to think about it. So congratulate yourselves for being here. Pat yourself on the back. And I usually finish the talk with this story, but I'll tell you the story now because I think it might offer you a solution if you're in the camp of, I really don't want to think about this. To me, I've been teaching for almost 20 years now. To me, this is the most important topic that I teach on in genealogy. And you'll be hearing me talk a lot this hour about prevention. And that's really one of the reasons that we put together a medical family tree, because we want to see what we're predisposed to in order to prevent it. We also want to have something to give to our children and grandchildren and the progeny to come. So if we're able to take what we can find in our genealogical research, and many of us already have a lot of it, you just don't know that, that it's, it's, you plug it into a medical family tree, um, we're able to give them what I like to call the gift of health. And that's really the purpose. So here's the story. The very first time I gave this talk, I was in Glenview. And I had a crowd about the size this big. And they talked a lot, especially about privacy issues, because at that point in time, uh, medical results, uh, doctor's offices and things were putting them online. And a lot of people did not like that. So they had a, a very nice, lively conversation about that. And <laughs> at the tail end, I had a gentleman come up to me with two of the textbooks that you have in front of you, one in each hand. And I thought, OK, this, this could be interesting. He introduced himself. His name was Bill. And he said, you know, I heard everything you said. I heard how important this is to do. And I agree. However, this is not for me. I don't want to think about this. But here's my solution. This book I'm giving to my son. And I'm going to say, son, you do my side of the medical family tree. This goes to my daughter. You do your mom's side of the family tree. The two of you get together, share the results, give it to my grandchildren. I don't want to know. <laughs> and if I gave you anything that you don't want, I apologize ahead of time. <laughs> and now we're done with that. <laughs> OK, so if you're from that camp, Maybe it's something that you can ask someone else in your family to do if you're uncomfortable to do, doing it. But again, to me, it's one of the most important things we can do. 
So the way I've structured this talk, since we're talking about DNA today, we're going to do most of that at the beginning, probably about the first half of the talk. We're going to uh, take a look at 23andMe.com, which is one of the largest commercial DNA testing companies, and they will give you health results. So we're going to take a look at a lot of still screenshots that I've taken from them. And then the second half, it's as if we put the cart before the horse. I'm going to talk about the medical family tree. If we already have an understanding of the genetic results that we can take offline, then I'll show you how you can plug them in to the medical family tree, which also talks about genealogical results. So I have four main points, and they should be right at the top of your handout for you to take away from you uh, if you want to do this when you go home. The first is predisposition. Everybody should understand what a predisposition means before we even talk about medical conditions. Think of a predisposition as the word risk, R-I-S-K, risk. It basically means if you are found to have a predisposition to a medical condition, you have a greater risk than people in the general public. That's all a predisposition means. It doesn't mean, oh, you have inherited something and you will get it. That's not what a predisposition means. Risk, that's what we're looking for. Even if genetically speaking, you see that you have inherited a base pair that makes you predisposed to something, it doesn't mean that you will develop the condition. It's just a possible risk. Second, any amount of accurate predisposition information you discuss with your physician can be helpful. Now, there's a couple of things that I want to talk about. Since we're looking at DNA predispositions in this talk, there's two things going on with DNA and the reports you can get from 23andMe.com. First is the science. And I'm going to explain to you how to read the scientific results. Those, they claim, are 99.999999% accurate. The second part is the interpretation of the scientific results. We are just starting down the path of understanding our DNA as far as being predis predisposed to health conditions. So sometimes you'll get your results back and you'll say, no, this is wrong, this is wrong. The test must be wrong. Well, the scientific test is probably correct, but the interpretation might be wrong at this point in time. So keep that in mind. There's two things we're looking at. Also, Date of disease onset. I'm going to talk a lot about that in the second half of this talk. When you are taking a DNA test with health predispositions, it's not able to currently tell you date of disease onset. What does that mean? Date of disease onset is just when you first exhibit symptoms of a medical condition. Only genealogical research at this point in time can give you date of disease onset. So that's one of the very important reasons why we need to interview our family and write down our own health conditions that include date of disease onset. We'll get into that a lot more. We cannot self-diagnose. We need to get expert advice. So two things on this. I am not part of the medical community. I am a genealogist. I've studied forensic genealogy, and I have about 20 years of genealogy teaching experience. So when you look at this book, I'm coming at it from the genealogical point of view. So I am not a trained medical expert, and I, I can't give you that. Second, if you're looking at health predispositions and you see something that seems to be a pattern in your family, all of us right here and now need to promise each other we are not going to become hypochondriacs. We're not going to freak out. What we're trying to do is gather the information in order to prevent, if it's possible, but we also want to be vigilant with our health. 
if we see we're predisposed to something and we see a symptom that might go with that, all we want to do is get medical advice from an expert. Okay. And fourth, we need to compile today's medical family tree by using both genealogical research, so that's what's in the textbook, and DNA predispositions, which we're going to look at from 23andMe. So I keep talking 23andMe.com, 23andMe. Currently, if you, well, let me ask you at this point in time, how many people have tested with 23andMe and got health? And got health. Oh, only a handful of you. Okay. Uh, so for most of you in the room, this is all going to be new. And I'm hoping to be able to give you a bird's eye view into whether this can help you. If so, currently it's a $199 test before a sale. So you're going to want to get a sale to bring down that price. Why is it $199? because they're also going to sell you what they call the ancestry portion, which is what you've heard about this morning, where they take and try to match you, other people in the database, to tell you your relationship possibilities. The health portion used to be sold separately, but now you can't get it separately. You have to get it along with the ancestry, so that's why it's $199, unfortunately. But we're going to be taking a look at three of the possible health results that you can get. Before we look at 23andMe.com, I want to explain the science behind the DNA. And I apologize if any of this is a duplicate from what you've already heard today. But if you understand the biology behind this all, you'll be able to interpret your results far better. And believe me, it's really easy. The first thing I need to talk to you about is base pairs. I'm sure we all are familiar with chromosomes in our bodies. When you look at a chromosome under a microscope, you're looking at what looks like a spiral ladder. We get half of our DNA from our father, half from our mother, and they literally hook up. So when you look at the spiral ladder, you're looking at where your father's hooked up with your mother's DNA at each particular location on each chromosome. And right here we have a base pair. Here's a base pair. Here's a base pair. So we are looking at a lot of base pairs on a chromosome. Let me explain what that means. When you inherit your DNA, there are four types of proteins, adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. And instead of using the long words, the scientists have decided just to use the capital letter of each of the proteins. So if we take a look at this first location, we see that one of our parents, and I can't, I can't see that too well, is it an AT? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We see that one of our parents gave us an A, which is an adenine protein, and at the same location, one of our parents gave us a T, thymine. So our base pair is an AT. Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Where do we know that this AT appears? Here's the address. It's called a marker. And usually markers will start with RS and then a number. They don't have to, but in most cases that I've seen. So RS-429358 has a base pair of AT. Now on some of these reports that you'll see from 23andMe, they'll tell you, hey, your genotype is AT. And you're looking at this big word, genotype, what is that? All that means is, what is your base pair at this location? Right? Genotype means your pair at the location. The other thing that we need to talk about is sequencing. When you heard that science was able to do our human genome and sequence all of our chromosomes, what they do is they look at your base pair on each location 
of the chromosomes, of your 23 chromosomes. What they do is they come up with a sequence, and this is how we do it. We're starting at marker RS42938, and for eight base pairs, we are literally counting off AT, AT, CG, CG. See what I'm doing? Literally, when they give you your scientific results, this is what they've done. They've gone in, looked at each of your protein base pairs at each location on your chromosomes. And that's how they're able to come up with the scientific results. Now, when you see them, it's just this big, long ATCG all over the place. And if you literally printed your results, you're going to have over 10,000 pages of 8.5 by 11 paper that just say AC. ATCG, and that's why they don't deliver your results that way because it makes no sense. But when you take them in combination with some of their tests and where they're finding certain base pairs can give you a predisposition to a medical condition, that's where it makes sense. And that's most of the reports you'll see at 23andMe. And we'll take a look at, at several of them. The other thing that we need to understand is what is a gene? I know that this is part of our vernacular, a gene. We all understand that it's part of a chromosome, but what does a gene mean? Literally, if you take base pairs for about 200 locations on one chromosome, that length of DNA sequencing is your gene. That's all that means. So if they're finding a condition within a gene, they're looking for base pairs at certain markers for about 200 base pairs. That's all a gene means. Everybody with me? Good, because if you understand this, you're going to get the whole rest of the lecture. This is excellent. Here's the other thing I want to explain ahead of time. In my classes, we, we call this the grandparent slide. When you're looking especially at traits between siblings or people in a family, you need to understand this concept of how you inherit your genes. Let's start with the baby. And if we look at chromosome 1 from father, and mother, we see that the father and mother have inherited their genes from their parents. So this would be the paternal grandfather, paternal grandmother, everybody with me? Maternal grandfather, maternal grandmother, and we see the colors. If you look at the baby's chromosome, on chromosome one, the baby got a little bit more of the paternal grandfather's genes than the paternal grandmother. So the colors you're looking at down here means that the baby inherited a little bit more from that color of a grandparent. So think about it. You have full siblings, but some of you trait-wise might resemble one part of your family, where another sibling looks like another part of your family. And it's because if you look at the, at the four different grandparents who you're inheriting from, you might have gotten a little bit more on one chromosome of one of your four grandparents. So if you understand that concept, that will help you in traits. And that's one of the things we're going to look at from 23andMe. So I keep saying it over and over. This is what the test looks like. They will mail it to you, and you want to spit in the tube because it's an autosomal test. If you take a look, this is what they're going to give you results online, so you have to have an account. And I used the name Respectfully Anonymous. I did not use my name. You can do that if you haven't, if you haven't already set up an account and taken the test yet. You have that right, although they tell you they want your legal name. Nope, you have the right to put the name you want. So I'm respectfully anonymous if you ever see that. Then if you look down the side column here, it's one of the ways to get at your 
reports once you log in. How many of you that have taken the health test took them a while ago? Anybody? Okay, several of you. Now, one of the things I like to tell people right here, look in this folder right here, reports archive, because a lot of the old tests from two years and previous are gonna be stuck here in the reports archive. Take a look in there, and I'll show you a slide a little bit later. Um, there's, it looks like almost 200 different reports from the old version to the new version. And what we're gonna be talking about is health, right here, the health sections. Another way to get to it at the top, if you highlight health, we're gonna look at these three things today. I'm gonna to show you screenshots. The health predispositions, um, for those of you who've known about 23andMe for a while, you know that the government asked them not to give health predispositions for quite a while. It was almost two years. And the reason that they asked them not to deliver the health is because they wanted it to be accompanied with an explanation. They didn't just want to have these reports out there. So what 23andMe does, they ask you to look at a tutorial on some of the health reports. So for those of you who did it a while ago, if you haven't logged in recently, to get at your reports, they're gonna want you to take a tutorial. And I will show you some of, just an example, so easy. But they just wanna make sure that if you're getting these health predispositions, you're not making life-changing decisions based only on the report. So remember, right at the beginning, where we all agreed we weren't gonna become hypochondriacs and we were gonna get medical advice, so if you see something alarming, make sure and talk to an expert about it. One of the types of reports is health predisposition. And for me, there's nine reports. And the things that I'm showing you, I don't mind showing you at all. There's some that I have not included here. So of course, that's what I didn't wanna show you. Uh, but you'll see that if you log in, they're gonna want you to take the tutorial that I was talking about, super easy. And this is an example of the health predispositions. So I'm gonna show you some detail about this. Late onset Alzheimer's disease. Why did I choose that one? Because there's a pattern that runs in my family and I wanted to see if I had a predisposition and if so, on what chromosome? and if they've identified base pairs. So this is an example of what I was telling you, the tutorial. Doesn't look too intimidating, does it? If you can get through that, you've gotten through the tutorial. There's about nine pages and that's it. So no big deal with the tutorial. When you're looking at the health predisposition, they will test for all of these conditions and then they will give you a rundown if you are showing a variant and if so, do you have an increased risk? All a variant means is at specific base pair locations on our chromosomes, many of us humans have a standard base pair. If you have something that is not the standard, they'll call it a variant. That's all it means. Then they'll tell you what your base pair is. So like I said before, this is the one that I wanna show you. I have a slightly increased risk based on the location that they tested. When you open it up, you can either have a summary or you can have medical detail. And so I'm gonna show you both. This is summary results. They try to explain and they do say that I have something that is not the standard base pair as my result here. And look at this, it's in a gene, APOE. And we all know what a gene is, right? Good, I'm seeing 100%, that's excellent. 
when you go into the detail, here's what we're looking for. The variant they've identified here in the gene, and they tell me the exact marker location for the base pair that differs from most people. Remember I told you genotype? That just means what is my base pair at this location? I have a C and a T. T is typical copy from my parent. So most people have the T. The variant comes with the C, the cytosine that I got from one of my parents. Now, is it telling me which parent gave that to me? No. That's one of the reasons why if you have a big family group available to test, you might want to have everybody take a health test. Then when you get your results, you're able to, to compare. And in my particular family, we did all take this. And you'll see a little bit later, and I think it's also on your handout when uh, I, I try to put it, catalog it, and, and uh, record the information. You'll see which one of my parents gave it to me. But at this point, you can't guess. So it might be a really good reason to have people in your family take the test. All of this information you see right here, too, you'll see it was recorded and I think this is the one that I used for your handout too. So you can, you can see where I got the information from that I put on your handout. Also, if you screen down that particular page, it gives you references. Now, in my mind, this is extremely important because they're telling you how did they come to these conclusions. They've been looking at scientific tests and trials based on this particular base pair or the gene that they identified. As they continue to look at new studies, new scientific information, they're going to add stuff down here. So you, as you continue to scroll down the screen, they have a list that says, we've added more information. And then they put more at the bottom. So to me, that's really important because I want to track First, what the medical community is doing, but second, how did they interpret my scientific results? Okay, it looks like you're all with me. Okay, good. <laughs> so taking a look, and this, this should be on your handout, if we want to record this information, I'm showing you how to do this before we plug it into the medical family tree. We are looking at a health predisposition. That's one of the three things we're looking at from 23andMe. Then we want to list what they say the chromosome, the marker, and the gene is that was tested. So here's that. Then my genotype, what was my base pair? And the variant is the C that I got from my parent. Everybody with me? See how easy this is when somebody just explains it to you? If you also want to have your whole family tested like we did, this is a very simple table that I came up with just to say who's got what. You see how I knew which part of my family? And guess what line in my family has this pattern genetically or genealogically? This one. <coughs> so we're seeing that genetically, it's matching up to the genealogy. We're going to get into that a little bit later. If you also want to add a second line below this to give a little bit more information in your record keeping, this is what I've done. The two people who display the variant C are predisposed, and I'm literally using 23andMe's language, slightly increased risk. And it's only based on this one gene, one base pair at this location, C, T. These two, not predisposed, no increased risk. Everybody with me? OK, you've all passed. You all have 100%, because that's the toughest part about what we're going to talk today. Let's talk about another part of 23andMe. It's the wellness reports. You get eight of those. Again, haha, these are kind of funny. I don't mind showing this all to you. 
For those of you who've taken these health tests, do you feel that they're accurate? No. I'm getting no and yes. Okay. Just based on what my family has said, looking at all of our results, we think it's about 75% accurate. But when it's wrong, it's really wrong. And I'll point out a couple of things to you. Here's one down here. See this? Muscle composition. My brother had the same result. He used to be a bodybuilder. <laughs> so yeah, I don't think that's right. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. Anyway, it gives you an idea. Some of the things that they can test for because they believe that they've narrowed in on base pairs that give us a predisposition to these certain conditions. It's funny when your whole family is together like we were doing this and I don't know why everybody was really into the whole earwax thing and I, you know, it just, it, it can be, it can be fun. We did that at Thanksgiving a couple of years ago. Here's an example, sleep movement. And I asked my husband, this is me, I'm average, about 12 movements an hour. And I asked my husband, would you say that's accurate? And he said, well, put it this way. If there was a end of the scale that says log, you sleep like a log, you'd be right there. So, okay, so you're saying not so much 12. He's like, 12 in a week. <laughs> okay, so some of these, maybe, maybe not. And that's where we are with the interpretation of our genes. So everybody see what I'm talking about, how I mentioned that at the beginning? Might just be that they're learning more and it's not accurate for everyone. When you get into the detail of it, we see this is my base pair, my genotype right here. Looking at the scientific results, they're looking on chromosome six in a gene. Here's the marker that's been tested that they've identified. That is my genotype. Now this is a really good place for me to pause for a second. I got four years of forensic genealogy training and the very first year I went, I, don't, I got lucky, I, so lucky. I was sitting next to a microbiologist who's one of the pioneers of identifying this and I was saying to him, you know, I'm not complaining, but when I look at my results from 23andMe compared to me knowing me, I would say at least a quarter is inaccurate. How is that? And he said, not only are we at the beginning of learning how to interpret this all, but in some conditions, it's more than one base pair. And it might be several base pairs working together but secondly, we have to look at environment. How does our environment act on us and our genes? And you don't see any of that right here. All we're seeing is one base pair. So a lot of these things you have to take with a grain of salt. Remember I was showing you the reference section, how they show the studies where they came up with their interpretation of these results? That to me is one of the reasons why the reference section is so important because it's a growing science. <coughs> if I was to take the wellness results for just this one thing and record them, this is how I would do it. They're looking at sleep movement and on chromosome six at the marker the la, la, in the gene, this is my base pair. This is my genotype, A, G. Everybody with me? Okay, so I'm not going to review that anymore. And I think this is one of them that's on your handout as well. If you go home and you want to do this yourself, all I would suggest is make sure that every single part that they put as far as the medical detail, you record somewhere on your results. You might have a variant, so I would add the variant back here. But in this particular test, they don't 
look for a variant. Looking at our family, we all, according to my husband, sleep like logs. <laughs> um, but then if you want to add likely to move about an average amount, that's literally the verbiage that you get from 23andMe. That's why I put that there. Next, traits. So the second kind of results that you can get, 28 of them, and this just gives you, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, and I got to tell you, all right, this is funny. This one right here, all right, I'm a singer, <laughs> and I've been told I have perfect pitch more than once, so no, so no. <laughs> Again, it might be more than one base pair that we're looking at, and... Right here, cilantro taste aversion, slightly higher. Guys, I can't get enough cilantro. My husband will say, I'm going to make you a mojito, but instead of mint, I'm putting cilantro since you love it so much, okay? <laughs> so just a couple examples. Yeah, it doesn't work for me. That's why I want to keep looking at the references, see how they came up with this, see if it changes over time. Traits, this is a good one, especially if you test a whole family. How did you come up with your eye color? For me, they're saying blue or green. They show you on average how they came up with it. My genotype is a GG. And they determined that likely blue or green for a GG. Here is the detail, scientific details. The marker that they tested, it's near a gene. Both of my parents gave me a guanine. And look at that. So some of this is based on the ethnicity that they're looking at for each person. Again, references. How did they come up with it? And if you want to record it, guess which person in my family here has the hazel color eyes? <laughs> Obviously. But this brings me to another very simple point. A lot of people ask me this. I can only inherit what my parents could possibly give me. So could I have inherited a cytosine, a C? Could I have inherited a thymine? No. I could have only inherited what they have. And that's one of the things that people don't realize until you, you're like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. You can only give what you have. I could only receive what they have. Again, I mentioned the reports archive, so for those of you who tested a long time ago, make sure and see if there are any reports still sitting there. And here's an example of the old report summary. Lots of reports. Look at all of these. This is one that I have manifested, basal cell carcinoma, twice in my arm slightly higher risk. Now, the other person who has this is my father. He has not developed it, but his brother has. And so when my uncle takes that test, I want to see, do you also have an AA? Could identify a pattern. These are a lot, lot of archived uh, reports. So go in there if you've taken it a while ago. Now let's move over to what's in the textbook, and we're going to talk about the genealogical approach to putting together your medical family tree. And then I'll also point out some of these results that we looked at from 23andMe, how to plug them into your medical family tree. I tried my best on the handout and also on the slides to tell you where in the textbook we are. So we're going to start with page three. The genealogical approach. Basically, as genealogists, we do have some of the information we might need. I'm going to cut to the chase. I'll spend a little bit more time on this at the end. 
genealogical records that I have found to be the most important for putting together a medical family tree, first, interviews. You have to interview your family. Second, death certificates. And you have to make sure that they've listed the cause of death. Going to get into that a lot more later. I want to introduce the idea of a medical family tree by looking at three case studies, pages four and five. And if I can find my glasses, we're in business. OK, good. There are two types of charts that you can make for a medical family tree. This one is disease specific. Everybody see this word right here, disease specific? So it only means I'm looking at one medical condition and it is insomnia. The second type of tree we'll look at in a few minutes looks at everybody that you share a significant amount of DNA with. But right now we're only looking at a disease specific tree. This one I put together, it was for my husband and we're calling him Jeremy, which is not his name. When Jeremy was 46 years old, he compiled a medical family tree. He had been suffering from sleeplessness for a couple of years that he thought might have been insomnia, but he wasn't really sure. So part of it was he interviewed his family and he found out that his mother and two sisters all had the same condition and it happened to all of them when they were around the ages of 40 to 45. He put this together and saw his physician. Also, when he shared this information with his younger sister, she had already seen her physician and he had given her some medication. So she was able to share with Jeremy what worked for her. Let me, put, let me explain this chart now. Uh, this is a standard genealogical chart that we add information to, and specifically, we're looking at male and female. So round or oval is female. Square or rectangular is male. Then we look down here to understand the rest. Shaded boxes are affected with insomnia. A slash through the box means the person is deceased. A tilde is approximately plus or minus, possibly the same more or less. It's a standard tree in the sense that we have generations horizontally. So as we're looking, we have one generation, which is Jeremy's, one generation back, which is the parents, two generations back, which is the grandparents, we have three children descending from the mom. Double line between two people means married. So we have two sets of grandparents, parents, and the three children. And from there, we go into the medical portion. So since these are shaded, it means they have been affected with insomnia. Since this is slashed, it means these people are deceased. And the subject of our tree right here, Jeremy, 100% means DNA-wise. He has 100% of his own genes. <laughs> and so he is the subject of this tree. Siblings typically are around 50%, but it could be more, it could be less. Sometimes it's usually less, at least the cases I've looked at, for a full sibling. We see that the parents are exactly 50% of Jeremy's DNA, and grandparents approximately 25%. So now think back to the grandparents slide. Remember how the baby didn't get exactly 25% of each grandparent on some chromosomes? There was a little more of one grandparent than another. So that's what you have to remember, approximately 25%. Looking at this medical family tree, just because it's for one disease is something that's very, very good if you need to talk to a medical expert. Because I'll tell you what I see the second I look at this. I see a pattern of shaded area. 
for three consecutive generations. This, to me, tells me if this condition is inheritable, it could be genetic. It also could be environmental. Are there things that this family is doing generation by generation that's keeping them up at night? So you have to think about it that way when you're looking at it. But that's one of the reasons why you put together a disease-specific tree, to see if you can identify a pattern and how it's being passed along. Let's look at another disease-specific tree. This is for Miranda, and this one is for ovarian cancer. And I chose this one because it's a very interesting case. Uh, and I'll just very quickly tell you about this one. Uh, she was going to start a family, and this was before we could get 23andMe.com predispositions. This was a while ago. And so she said, could you just look at my family tree and tell me if there's anything I'm predisposed to? And what we found was her maternal, her paternal grandfather, so that means her father's mom, died very young, 38, from ovarian cancer. And she said to me, oh, well, that's fine. That was from my dad's side of the family, right? And I said, well, one of the things that we have to do is look at how each disease can be passed down through the family genetically. And this is one of them that you can have an obligate carrier, meaning he obviously does not have the female parts, but he can carry that variant of the disease. So he's called an obligate carrier. And it is possible that she could have inherited that. So that's one of the things that you want to do as far as prevention goes. See what you're predisposed to. See if it's going, uh, and make sure that you understand the symptoms of that. At the back of the textbook, Appendix D identifies a few and I'm going to say that word again, a few, two words, a few <laughs> um, symptoms that are accompanied by medical conditions. And that back there is only an example of what you want to do when you're putting together your medical family tree, but also your predisposition results sheet. When you fill in that sheet, you want to take the information that you see in Appendix D. So if it's not there, what I do is I go to the Mayo Clinic online, and they have a wonderful guide that often tells you if a condition is genetic. Okay. So here's the story. <coughs> Turns out that she had inherited that variant, and she did get ovarian cancer. But at the first sign of any symptom, she immediately went to her physician. They operated. They got it. And so this is one of the examples of a predisposition that can help you prevent a condition. She didn't freak out. She just took care of it and was vigilant. This is a third example of disease-specific tree, colon polypsis and colon cancer. And I don't mind telling you that Jane is me. Now, the story of this is we all knew that we had a predisposition on my father's side of the family. So here's, let's see, where's my dad? Here's my dad. Because his father passed away from it when he was 58 years old. So we all knew that we had that predisposition on that side of the family. Now, in the medical community, they will tell you at age 50, it's good to have a colonoscopy just to go in and check if there are polyps. And if you remove the polyps, you remove the threat of developing cancer because that's the way the cancer uh, configures itself if you have a, have a polyp. So I talked to my physician. I was about 40 years old. And I said, I, my grandfather died of this. Shouldn't I be taking that test ahead of time? He's like, no problem. Don't worry about it. Well, it turns out that my mother was diagnosed with stage 3C colon cancer. None of us had any idea that it was even part of her family history medically. Why? Her parents were farmers. They never saw the doctor, 
ever. So there were no medical records that it might be a part of her pattern of family history. We had no clue whatsoever. So about a week after she was operated on, everything was fine. I went in to show, to show my physician, well, this is now my, my medical family tree for this one. And even before I could get the sentence out of my mouth, he's writing me the referral. Please go get a colonoscopy. <laughs> and you know, I don't want to be the person giving you too much information, but to say that luckily colon cancer is something we can prevent. And I have had four colonoscopies in the last 15 years, and I've had almost 20 polyps removed. The average is maybe one or two in your whole lifetime. So yeah, my husband calls me a polyp-making machine. <laughs> um, but because I knew I had that predisposition, I could talk to a medical professional, and then I could seek preventative measures. Because in this case, like I said before, it's preventative. So if we look down here, lightly shaded box, again, means that you're affected with the colon polyps. Here we go. Black means that you got colon cancer. So just quickly looking at this, we can see a pattern. But in this case, we don't know because they were untested. So if you have that kind of occasion and there's something you can do, like when you're 50 years old or whenever, just get a colonoscopy, I, or I guess there's a mail-in test now that you can do that without any history. I would recommend that you do that. So now that we understand the idea of putting together a medical family tree, I just want to give you a few other quick things. Who should we test? In your book, pages 8 through 11, we need to test the people who we share the most DNA with because a predisposition means that if you share about 50% of these people's genes and they inherit a condition, you have a chance, a risk, of developing the same thing because you have some of the same genes. Same thing with your children and grandchildren. The second degree, you have about 25% of the same genes as these people. If you could only come up with a family tree for a few people, make sure it's your first degree relatives, the ones you share about 50% with. If you can also add the second degree, the ones you share about 25% with, you are really doing well. There is a form in the textbook if you, as you're interviewing people and finding information, if you want to fill it in in the textbook, that might keep it all together with you within the book so that way you can find it all. Like I said before, interviewing your family is one of the most important things you can do. In the book, pages 15 through 17, I give you lots of questions to ask. One of the forms that I think really worked well for me, I put together every possible medical condition I could think of, like even warts and you know whatever freckles, just because you want to find everything you could have inherited. And it gives you a checklist when you're asking and interviewing. Genealogical research for the information. If you want to do more genealogical research, like to try to find doctor's records, hospital records, I don't want to be a bummer, but to be realistic, sometimes they are very difficult to get. So don't get frustrated. Just keep trying and trying and trying. Sometimes you might have to network to find other living relatives to interview. Sometimes it all depends how friendly your ancestors were. Sometimes neighbors can tell you, oh, yeah, they were going to the hospital to be treated for this. When I interviewed my father's side of the family, the first person I started with was my uncle, who is in the medical community. He could tell me the exact names of conditions, and if they were being treated with medicine, what was the name of the medicine, what did and did not work. And I want to record all of that and pass that down through the family. It's 
So that was my advice from the beginning. Get these two things. Now let's take a look at the second kind of form that I just mentioned. This is an inclusive family tree where each person has their own box. You start with yourself down here at the bottom. You are 100% of your own DNA. As you're discovering medical conditions, you want to list them here. And what we were looking at, remember we looked at late onset Alzheimer's from 23andMe genetic test. See how I literally, and I made this bigger on purpose so you can see it. See how I'm adding it to my conditions right here? Let me explain. The, the triangle means it is inheritable. The circle means I see it somewhere else on this family tree, so there is a possible pattern. What is the condition called? And what is the age of disease onset? That can only come from the genealogical information of identifying what age you were when you first showed those symptoms. If you can come up with this, and you're able to pass that along through your family, you are giving the gift of health to people who want to take their predisposition seriously and act when they see symptoms to get medical expert advice. And then we have the children and the grandchildren generation here. There are two ways that you can come up with a family tree like this if you want to do it online. Instead of filling in the book, or I've actually had some students that take the eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper and write a box for each person so that way you, it's big and you can tape it to the wall or put it on the carpet uh, so that way you can see the medical conditions. But if you want to do it online, uh, I think it's the Attorney General who put this on the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Literally, you come to this page, My Family Health Portrait, and you create a family health history. Now, I do have to talk about privacy for just a couple of minutes here. My husband and I are very tight with our privacy for anything. Like, we don't even do online banking. So I would not fill this in for myself, but I did do a fake one to show you what it looks like. Okay. You enter your personal information. So for me, my fake me. <laughs> yeah, that is so not true. Okay. <laughs> and then you put in how many brothers and sisters you have, and it creates the tree for you. And as you're editing and you're putting in people's medical conditions, it comes out looking like this. And you have to be live. You put your cursor here, and it'll give you a drop down. Here's all the medical conditions for this person since my cursor is on there. There's a company that will allow you to make an electronic family tree for free called tapgenes.com. They also offer health services. They're kind of like a middleman for putting together your medical family tree. And then if you want to do, uh, like, hire a geneticist to go over your results or get medical conditions, they can help you find the right person. Yes, in the back. Yeah, let's see if I can get there. Oh, I see it. I see it. It's coming up next. Oh, boy. Is it on the handout? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, let's keep going. A few more things. 
five more minutes and then, then I'm supposed to finish at 2.30, right? Okay, five more minutes and we're done. Along with the medical family trees that I've showed you, there's two medical family trees, there is also a predisposition results sheet and you can see the blank and also a filled in example in the textbook. And there's a whole lot of blue here and it's not to overwhelm you, just to show you what's possible. You fill in a sheet per person. So this would be for me and there's a lot of <coughs> fake stuff here. The reason you want to fill in one of these is if you're talking to a medical professional like a genetic counselor or maybe you know your GP or, or uh, whoever you're talking to, you want them to be able to quickly look at your, your predisposition, your risk. You list one medical condition here in Appendix D or online, I would suggest the Mayo Clinic again, you look to see if it's inheritable and if there is a pattern, who has displayed the symptoms, what was their age when the symptoms first started, how much DNA do you share with them, and what is the family line. This, all, this only just helps you identify a pattern. Why is it important to identify patterns? Because if it's genetically being passed down, you want everyone in that family line to know so they can take preventative measures if it's possible. Okay. Okay. Let me just tell you this last thing, two, two quick things. If you're looking to hire a genetic counselor, their headquarters is in The Loop in Chicago. And I think I have the website on your handout and then finally, Seven steps to putting together your medical family tree that we talked about, pages six and seven of the textbook. It literally walks you through what we just talked about. Okay, well, I've got uh, one question from the people online. I'm oh, sorry, I should have, should I probably say that. Sorry. Um, so. Uh, yes. So yes, we have one question from uh, from Laura or. Luana online, um, she wants to know, can testing children help when there is no grandparent living? It will show their predispositions. It will show their predispositions. Okay, all right, fantastic, because she's watching on the webinar online, so thank you for sending that question in. Are there any questions from the audience? I have one very excited person in the back who has a question. <laughs> The, at the bottom of your handout, I think, for, for the genetic counseling. And I do have to tell you, I had a student who, who spoke with them and they did more testing on one specific medical condition and that woman felt like it saved people, well, her granddaughter's life for sure. So talk to a medical expert if you have any questions. Uh, two, uh, two more questions and then we have to wrap it up. So, there's somebody in Robert. What piece of advice would you provide family members putting together things like this to prep them for this? Because they're going to be looking at this information going, oh my goodness. Right. So, what advice would you provide if you were going to put this together for your family? What's the advice? Two things. Like we all agreed at the beginning, we are not going to freak out, become hypochondriacs, but we're going to be vigilant. We're going to look for symptoms. That to me is the most important thing. And then second, we have to seek medical advice if we see a symptom. Yes? Um, with the um, DNA testing company is most reputable. In this particular example, 23andMe is the only testing company of the commercial ones that will give you health results. If you need it to be more specific than that, you should probably talk to your physician or a genetic counselor, and they can guide you to a more specific test. Okay, okay. thank you. That's okay, it? well, thank you, everybody. Please give Marsha a warm round of applause.
And um, thank you to all of our friends who are watching online and watching in uh, here in person. Thank you so much for coming out for Genealogy Day uh, 2019. So we hope that you enjoy the webinar. Please uh, email our speakers uh, if you have any additional questions or email your library or our library if you need any help with your research. Um, and have a really great day. And thank you so much for a really great year and a really great program. Thank you very much.